With all this business these days about Christmas, I thought it would be a good idea to have a look at Christmas from a work sense, especially because Christmas has fallen on such hard times these days. This is the age of complete, absolute blame, irresponsibility. It's everybody else's fault. Everybody else has to change so that I get to feel comfortable the way I am, so that I never have to change anything. People are putting up Christmas lights and nativity scenes and this and that, and I don't want them to do that because that makes me incredibly uncomfortable because I'm not a Christian. I'm a Buddhist, and we don't do that. Or I'm not a Christian. I'm Jewish. Not only do we not do that, but we're offended because the Christians have tried to wipe us off the face of the earth. They're against us. They do all kinds of mean, nasty things against us. I'm really offended by the fact that they're trying to make me celebrate Christmas and make me become like them. I don't want to be like them. They're not nice people. They kill you if you don't agree with them. You have all this going on. So I don't want to change. I want everybody else to change. So we go to court. And we make them take down their nativity scenes. We make them take down their Christmas lights. We make them stop doing all this stuff because it's on public property. And the public property is mine as much as it is anybody else's. I'm part of the public. I want to have this shoved in my face. It's just wrong. So Christmas has fallen on hard times. It used to be you had Christmas, you had Hanukkah, you had whatever you had. And it was like, that was that. Not anymore. Now it's a big political thing. That's a big political statement. Now people take sides. Now we get offended. Well, maybe we were always offended, but I don't remember it that way. Now, maybe that's just me. Christmas is different for us today, but part of the difference is because we're adults. And Christmas is very different when you're an adult than it is when you're a child. And why is that? What is it that makes Christmas so different? In a word, what is the difference? Responsibility. Okay, that's a good word, responsibility. Presence. Presence. Presence, P-R-S-E-N-T-S. -S. Okay. Yes. Essence. Essence. Well, Matt is very close. In fact, Matt's hit it. The difference is essence. The difference between how a child views Christmas and how we view Christmas is a child, a child, a small child, views Christmas with wonder. They just view it with wonder. Why is that? <laughs> because they are closer to essence. Now, essence in us is very undeveloped. It's very childish. But in a child, it's still very undeveloped and very childish. But it's closer to the surface because they haven't got as many overcoats on. Overcoats are what the work calls the layers of false personality that coat us as we live year after year and as we go through life until we end up huge. You know, imagine yourself, you know, like this huge thing with like 60 or 70 overcoats on. Each one has to be bigger to cover up the last one. A child, they come into the world naked. They don't come into the world with overcoats. They come into the world naked and they are essence. And they're absorbed in their own world, really. They're absorbed just in their own essence. It takes them a while to start to notice that they're here and notice that we're here. And then it takes them a while to start to imitate us and to become like us and lose all of their wonder and become like us, going to court about Christmas, going to court about presents, going to court about Hanukkah, going to court about Christmas lights or Christmas trees or nativity scenes, the insanity of it all. Children are not interested in that. They're interested in the wonder of the whole event, the wonder of the whole season. They're interested in the wonder of life. They're interested in the wonder of their hand. Have you ever noticed a child at the wonder of their hand? They look at their hand and they go, whoa, look at that. It's got things that move. Wow, and it tastes good too. What more could anyone ask for? And it's warm, and now it's wet. And oh, the sensations. Of course, they don't know their sensations. It's just, oh, that feels good. Oh, the movement, just the idea that a hand can move. Then, then you see dawn in their little minds that they have something to do with the movement of it. Oh, I can make it move. It just moves on its own for a while. Then they start to realize that they can actually make the fingers move. They don't even know their fingers yet. So they're still full of wonder. And we're full of something else that isn't wonder. <laughs> Soon enough, children are given answers that stop them from wondering. I wonder what those are on this. Well, they're your fingers, honey. Oh, those are my fingers. Wonder's over. We now know. I remember one time when I was in school. This guy I was in school with. He had a son, a little guy, two or three or four years old. He was a really little guy. 
cute little kid. But what kid three or four isn't really two, three, four years old isn't? They're all cute. You know, they're just full of wonder. Curly hair and, and fresh face and big wonder eyes. And he was out with his child and he was an amateur photographer and he was out photographing nature with his son. And his son saw this bird and look, daddy. And his father caught himself telling his son what kind of a bird it was. Oh, yes. Blah, blah, blah. That's a blah, 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 blah bird. And he realized what he had done, that he had snatched away the child's wonder and replaced it with some of himself, some of his unwonder classification, pigeonholing. Well, that's this. Okay, that's you never have to wonder about that anymore. That's handled. Forget the wonder. Get on with life. And we do this. We basically coat our children like M&Ms with a hard shell because we feel that there's this soft milk chocolate center that will melt if it touches life directly. And so we coat them with this hard shell personality. We do it to ourselves, or we had it done to us, basically, and we did it to ourselves, and then we give our children this gift to protect them from life. We prepare them for life. We protect them from life. We make them like us. And this shell is personality. And though we take it for granted, there is a mystery to life. There is a mystery to our existence. And very small children are in touch with that mystery and the wonder of it all. And we have lost touch with it. We have lost touch with the mystery because we take it all for granted. Oh, yeah, that's a blue jay. Yeah, that's the sun. Oh, yeah, they're clouds. Mm -hmm. well, cumulus clouds. They're not just clouds. Whoa, look at those clouds. Oh, yes, they're cumulus clouds. We want to define everything. We want to have everything named so that we can control it because we feel like if we can name it, we can control it, we can overcome it, we can make it do what we want it to do because the wonder of life is gone. And all we're left with now is this chaos that we somehow feel like we have to make order of in order to control it, in order to stop it from doing what we don't want it to do, in order to protect our soft inner milk chocolate core. Throughout the ages, attempts have been made to wake us to this mystery. Mostly we call these attempts religion. And it's strange because when you think about the word religion, you don't really see that it was an attempt to wake people up because religion has degenerated into something that actually keeps people asleep. Its purpose is really not to wake people up. Its purpose becomes to keep people asleep, keep people asleep in this religion so that they give their money to this church or temple or mosque or whatever, so that they follow this party line. But the whole idea of waking people up, that's gone now. Well, we want to wake people up to the wrongness of that and the rightness of this. That's not the same thing as the wonder and the mystery of our existence and of life. It's not the same thing at all. It's more mechanical. Our hard shell is so strong that these attempts eventually become useless, giving way to other attempts with the same aim. What does that mean? It means that religions, schools, esoteric schools come up and they appear in different ages and in different parts of the world at different times, but they eventually give way to others because the attempts soon fail. They soon become mechanical. They soon are taken for granted. Christmas is like that. We take it for granted. Or it's about, like Steve said, presents. Or it's about whatever. But it becomes about something else. Or it's about lawsuits. Or it's about making those people stop doing that to me. It's about all the stuff that the hard shell is about, that the overcoats are about, that the personality is about. But none of the stuff that the essence is about, the wonder, the mystery, the joy, all that's gone. What's left is what we can control, what we can manage, what we can direct, what we can make happen the way we think it should happen. The hard shell, external man, is connected to external life via the senses so completely that we're asleep to the part of us that wonders. How obvious is this when you have a moment, a childlike moment of joy, when you just get it? You get the mystery of your own existence. You get the magic of your own hand, of your own fingers, of the fact that you can move them independently. If you're here for just a moment and you'll look at that without all the personality in between it and you, you will see what a miracle it is, what a miracle your body is, what a miracle the fact that I can talk, the fact that words are coming out. I don't know what's going to come out. I have no idea what will come out of my mouth, but something will. And the amazing thing is, the wonderful thing is that it will be about whatever it is I'm talking about, whatever it is I've decided to talk about. How that happens, I don't know.
Oh, yes, there's some preparation. But that preparation is somewhere else now. Right now, this just this happening, this event, this present thing that's happening is a wonder. It's a mystery. It's a miracle to me. How the brain does this, I don't know. How my emotions get involved in this, I don't know. How my body gets involved in this, I don't know. How I get you involved in this, I don't know. What it is that draws something from you, that warms something in you, that sparks something in you, I don't know what that is. I don't know how that works. It's a mystery to me. This job that I do in life is a mystery to me. And it's always a mystery. It's like, wow, who would know? I mean, how could I know? How could I ever know that I'm going to say something and somebody's going to be moved and somebody else is going to be irritated? It's like, wow, how'd that happen? That's a mystery to me. Well, how it happens, of course, is we each take impressions however we take them, according to how many overcoats they have to get through. And of course, they never or rarely ever get through all the overcoats. We let our impressions fall pretty much in our false personality. Asleep, we take for granted our existence and the existence of the universe. This keeps us in bondage to the external world, in bondage to nature in bondage to its laws. And nature is unkind. If you ever watch animal shows on television, you used to watch them until they got to be too woo. You remember the March of the Penguins? That was a tough one for me. I didn't like that. Well, I don't like to see things getting eaten. I don't like to see little babies freezing to death. I don't like that. I don't like the harshness of nature. I don't like the impersonality of nature. I like to imbue nature with anthropomorphism, with some kind of feeling, with some kind of meaning. <laughs> I don't like the fact that I am here on a planet where the meaning of everything is first you're born, then you serve, then you die. Well, what do you serve? You serve my purpose. Who am I? Well, I'm nature, and I don't really care about anything except my purpose. Something in me says there's got to be more. There's got to be something better than that. Now, a lot of people like, to, well, you should just accept it the way it is. No, well, that's fine. You accept it the way it is. If you think it's so great, you accept it the way it is. You be like that. I don't want to be like that because I think that there's another avenue open to me. I think there's another way open to me, and I want that way. But if you'd like this other way, Fine, have it. You want to live in nature? Go live in nature. That's okay with me. But I've found nature to be too unkind for me, too mindless for me, too mechanical for me. I want something more. I want some compassion. I want some intelligence. And when I say intelligence, I mean conscious intelligence, wisdom. I'm not saying nature isn't intelligent. Nature is intelligent in a very cunning way. It's a survivor. But serving nature, serving its purposes, <laughs> that's, that's not what I want. I don't want to serve nature's purposes because nature's purpose for me is to live, to procreate, to die, and to feed the worms. I want more. If you want that, great, have that. But I want more. People who sleep taking for granted their own existence in the universe, that of the universe. People in bondage to the external world, to nature and its laws. Such men, if they think, believe somehow that nature created itself. When you think about this, I mean, if you just take a moment, go back to the hand, and oh, how does that work? I don't know how I move my fingers. I don't know. Now, I know that there are those of you here who know all about it, and you could probably tell me what kind of bird that is, too. But I don't want to know, because that knowledge isn't real knowledge. That's just something that you have to salve your feeling of being out of control, your feeling of chaos, your feeling of insignificance in this vast universe, whereas... My feeling of insignificance in this vast universe is wonderful. It fills me with wonder. I look at it and I think, wow, <laughs> I'm like this grain of sand, not even. This planet is like a grain of sand in the galaxy, not even. If you look through a telescope and you look at something and you see it's like this, this swirl of kind of smoke in the heavens, in the universe, out there, the star. And then you find out that, well, that swirl of smoke is made up of little suns. That that's what makes that, that smoke look like that's just billions and billions of suns. And some of them have solar systems. It's like, yikes. For me, that's wonderful. For me, my insignificance just fills me with wonder. Some people, their insignificance fills them with dread, fear, clutching, contracting. Gotta control it, gotta fix it, gotta stop everything from being out of control, not the way I want it to be. <sighs> Forget that. That's not gonna happen. You can think it's gonna happen, but it's not gonna happen. There's no way you can do it. So, these people, 
think that nature created itself somehow, the Big Bang Theory. Oh, it was this explosion. I love the Big Bang Theory. I really do. There was this explosion, and this is what appeared. Wow. <laughs> that takes a lot of faith. To follow that one down takes a lot of faith. It's like, well, how was the Gettysburg Address written? Well, I see, I lived in Camden, New Jersey. I was born and raised in Camden, New Jersey, so I know how the Gettysburg Address was written because Princeton is also in New Jersey, and Albert Einstein was at Princeton when I was growing up in New Jersey. So just by the fact that Albert Einstein was in the same state, I got really smart. <laughs> and growing up right around the corner from Campbell's Soup, I knew that one day there was this explosion in Campbell's Soup Factory. That was the day they were making alphabet soup. And yes, this is true. The Gettysburg Address blew onto the wall in little alphabet noodles, and it spelled out the Gettysburg Address. And that's the Big Bang Theory. You know, it's like, okay, whatever. Is that impossible for an explosion in the Campbell Soup Factory and the alphabet soup to blow on the wall and spell out the Gettysburg Address? Well, no, it's not impossible. It's highly unlikely, but it's not impossible. It could happen. It's possible. I couldn't calculate the probability of it. I don't know anyone who could, but I couldn't personally calculate, nor would I even try. But it's fun to think about, and I've thought about that enough. The problem is, is that the Campbell Soup Factory came along, well, too late, because Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address way earlier than that. So that theory shot. But the Big Bang Theory, or whatever, is next. They're strange ideas, really. I mean, when you think about them, they're just strange ideas. Well, nature created itself. Okay, okay. If that makes you happy, believe that. Hypnotism is what the work calls power that external life exerts on us in this state of sleep in which we are out of touch with the wonder, the mystery of our own existence and of the universe. We're out of touch with the mystery of our own existence, our own hands, our own hair, our own nails. And my nails are growing right now. How do they do that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, how? I don't get it. You know? But it's okay. I don't have to get it. All I have to do is get it. You see the difference? It's like I don't get the specifics of how does this work, but I get that it does work and that it's miraculous. I would rather live in this inner state of mystery and wonder at the miraculousness of life than to have all the answers, only to find out later that the answers were wrong. That's the one thing that they always find out. They always find out that the latest theory corrects the last theory. Well, this is theory 101B. This is theory 102D. What happened to the other 100 theories before that? Well, we've updated them. It's like software. Version 2.9.3.5. What does that mean? It means something to somebody, but not to me. I'm sure it means something to programmers. To what purpose? Why does external life hypnotize us? Why does it want to keep us asleep? To what purpose? To keep us enslaved. Why don't we educate cows? Because they would uh, not want to do what... Because they would not want to do what we want them to do. Why don't we educate sheep? Because they would not want to do what we want them to do. We don't want sheep talking. We don't want cows. <laughs> going, car, everybody get down. <laughs> we don't like that idea. That's a Gary Larson idea, you know, a bunch of cows all standing around smoking cigarettes or talking, you know, and then one of them's like, oh, look out, car, and they all get back down and moo and eat the grass, you know. We don't like smart cows. We want dumb cows. We like it that way. That way we feel better about clubbing them on the head and eating them or whatever. So we don't educate things because we like to keep them the way they are. To what purpose would external life exert hypnotism on us to keep us in this state of sleep <laughs> so that it continue controlling us, enslaving us, having us serve its purpose or its purposes? You serve a purpose on this planet. Your physical body serves a purpose on this planet. You have a choice. You can be this outer external man or you can start to develop this inner man and escape from the purpose that the earth has for you, that nature has for you. But you've got to wake up to do that, and that's where this work comes in. This hypnotism keeps us turned outward so that our essential part, the part that is the wandering child in us, we talked about the little child, so a little child looks at Christmas like, wow! We look at Christmas like, oh God, the traffic, oh, the bills, oh, this, oh, I've got to get this for this person, I've got to send out cards, I've got to, got to, got to, the list just grows. I look at you, listen to you, I listen to you, and I think, oh man, 
Give it up, people. But then nothing will get done. Oh, how harsh. Nothing will get done. How about if the only thing that got done was the really important stuff? But this is all really important. <laughs> Not really. And you know that. See, we all know that. That's why we resent doing the other things. See, as we get older, we start to resent this time of year. Not all of it, but parts of it. Well, why is that? Well, because we're busy doing the things that we don't really want to do because we think that they need to get done. Because the overcoats are walking us around. Instead of us moving, we get so many overcoats on that we can't move. The overcoats have a life of their own then. What's happening? Well, I don't know. The damned overcoats are moving my arms. <laughs> overcoats are moving my legs. The overcoats are making me do this. See, our thoughts start to think us. Our feelings start to feel us. Our life isn't ours anymore. It has become the life of this thing that life has created, that external life has created, this false personality. And we're no longer in control of anything. It's in control of everything. And we think, well, we'll just go along with it. Can't be so bad. And that's what most of us are doing. And that's called the hypnotism of life. So we're turned outward so that our essential part can't develop. Only when we begin to feel and wonder about life's mystery does it become possible to awaken from sleep. This capacity is called magnetic center. What has this all got to do with Christmas? Everything. And if you can't see everything that it's got to do with Christmas, let it give you an idea of your condition. Your condition is you can't think because you're wearing so many helmets. You can't move because you're wearing so many overcoats. You can't feel because you've got so much between you and life. So much personality, so many hard shells, so many layers between you and life. Whereas children, small children, they don't have that. They experience life directly, but we do not experience life directly. We experience life through all these helmets, through all these overcoats, through all these shells that we've grown. You know, a pearl starts as a grain of sand that irritates a clam or an oyster, a mollusk. Let's leave it that way. And so in order to ease that irritation, the mollusk coats the grain of sand with something smoother. They call that mother of pearl. And it coats it again and again and again, layer after layer after layer. And the longer it's there, the more it coats it with a smooth, soft substance. And it becomes a pearl. And a pearl is really layers. It's not just one solid thing. There, boink, it was a pearl. Layer after layer after layer. And that's what happens with us. The longer we are in life, sleeping in life, the fatter we get, the bigger we get with coat after coat after coat of whatever it is that we're growing in life to stop the irritation. If we can see there are life influences, well, there are life influences. There's Wall Street, there's the government, there's the court system, there's the police over there, there's the job, there's the electric company, there's the water company, and they all want to be paid for their services and for whatever they're giving us. Those are the influences of life. If we can see that, but we can see also that there are other influences, like the Gospels, like the Bible, like esoteric teachings, there are other influences. If we can see that, we begin to feed and nourish our inner essential side because we can see that there is a difference. There is an outer world and an outer life, but there is also an inner world and an inner life. And when, once we begin to see the difference and distinguish between the two, we begin to feed our inner self, the inner man. As we are, we're dominated by life, unable to develop our essence. It remains in a childish state. People talk about essence. Oh, uh, I'm really in my essence now. I don't think so. <laughs> when do you see little kids do that? You know, I'm really in my essence now, man. You know, cart man. You know. That's not essence. That's obnoxious. Starts with a different letter. When we die, personality breaks up. If it's got hard spots in it, the breakup is painful. Has your personality got hard spots in it? <laughs> then look forward to pain. When we die, when is that? Oh, it better be today. Today would be a good day to die. Today would be a good day to start to die. Today would be a good day to die. To what? To the outer man, to the personality running everything, to the personality seeing everything its way, to the personality moving you around, to the overcoats running you, to the boots making you walk, to the helmet making you think. Die to that. Today would be a good day to start that. Essence returns and is reborn. If there's no growth of essence, then the inner man has no growth. If there's no growth of essence and there's no growth of the inner man, life will be the same because your being attracts your life. If you change your essence, your life cannot possibly be the same. There's no way. It cannot happen. 
It must be different. Even if it's exactly the same address, exactly the same person you're with, everything else is exactly the same, it's all different if your essence is changed. Because you cannot possibly see it the same way. It's impossible mm -hmm. to see it the same way. It's impossible if your essence has actually changed. Try to remember your personality is not you. This is difficult to remember, but try to remember. When Gurdjieff says, I wish to remember myself, this is what he means. Your personality is not you. Try to remember that. Try to remember just that simple thing. My personality is not me. Ah, my personality is not me. Then why is it making me do all this? Because it has enslaved you so that you can be a tool of life, a tool of nature, and serve its purposes and its laws. You see, you lie behind your personality. Something the work calls real I lies behind all of the manifestations of the personality, especially false personality, which is least you. False personality is the least you that you have. Personality is not all bad. We have personality and we have false personality. The predominant, the overwhelming part is false. But there is some personality that survived. Some personality that naturally is, is more like a pearl that naturally coats essence. But this other thing, you open up an oyster and there's a rock and there's a pearl. Throw away the rock and keep the pearl. False personality causes most of the useless suffering in this pain factory that we call Earth. We forget. See, you forget all the time. I look at you. I look at you in your life. Here you are out there running around out there in the pain factory. Oh, I can't wait to get this. Oh, I want to get that. Oh, the pain factory. Oh, it's such a wonder. It's like this is not a superstore, people. Everything that you buy is labeled happy. Everything that you go after is labeled make you happy, wonderful. But when you get inside of it, you find that it's not what it was advertised to be. It doesn't make you happy. It makes you have a tummy ache. Sometimes the tummy aches are severe, leading to death. Sometimes they're just like the flu. Sometimes they just make you throw up and do other things. But sometimes they kill you. So be careful what you're taking off the shelf in this pain factory, this pain factory superstore that we call the planet Earth. Because when you get that home and you start imbibing and digesting that, you're poisoning yourself. Because it's not making you happy as it was supposed to do, as it was advertised to do. Your whole life is full of things. The dump, the dumps of the world are filled to overflowing with happiness that didn't deliver. Your garage is filled with happiness that didn't deliver. The thing that you couldn't wait to get, that you were willing to spend your hard-earned shekels for, is now junk. And you just don't have the courage quite yet to send it to the dump. You'll have to wait a little bit longer. Being born on this planet, we've got to win real I by self-observation, by not identifying. It's not going to be given to us. We're not going to take it off the shelf here in the Superstore Pain Factory. We have got to earn it. Real I has to be earned. And the only way to earn is through self-observation and not identifying. Well, I observe myself all the time. Yes, you do, but you have to add to that not identifying. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we'll get to that later then. It's not given. The reason all the attempts to awaken us fail is because we take the line of least resistance. We take the mechanical way of life. But it says it's going to give me happiness. It says right there on the label. I'll take two of those, just in case my wife wants one. And you know that'll make you happy if your wife is happy too. I'll take two of those because my husband wants Oh, that's good. That'll make you happy. That'll make you twice as happy if you get two of them. No, won't work that way. The teachings of Jesus are reduced to a set of external rules for outer man to obey. It's not given. So you obey all those external rules, and you're not given real eye. What you're given is a better external man. And that's what religion gets reduced to on this planet for us. The high ideals, the truth, the esotericism of the whole thing gets reduced to, calcified to, this lower thing for external man. So what does religion do? Makes good people, right? What kind of good people? Well, they don't steal. Oh, well, what does that mean? Well, they don't go into stores and take stuff and leave the stores without paying for them. But they will borrow something from the neighbor and forget to return it. Well, I just forgot and steal it. Or they'll pick up a $20 bill in the street and put it in their pocket. Well, they didn't steal it. It's just there. It wasn't anybody's. And finders, keepers, losers, weepers it was so funny. 
last night, Rex came in to the house, and he said uh, to Lori, did you lose a $20 bill? Lori said, no. She said, but I did pay Josh $20. And Rex said, well, there's a $20 bill lying out in the street. I'll, I'll go get it then. So he goes out and he picks up the $20 bill and he comes back in the house. Now, he seen the $20 bill lying in the street, but he just looked at it and said, well, it's not mine. Someone listened to me. If I hadn't been lying on the sofa, I would have fallen down. Rex went back out and got the $20 bill. And I said, oh, Lori, well, would you know the $20 bill? She said, oh, it was a new one. It was fresh. It was clean. It was crisp. I said, okay. So Rex brings the $20 bill. And he said, it was lying out there flat as a piece of paper, because it is a piece of paper, lying out there right by the tire of the car, and it's nice and crisp. And Lori said, well, that's probably the $20 bill that I paid John. So Rex called Josh up. Did you lose $20? Well, he, yeah, I sure did. <laughs> Is it a green one with Jefferson on it? Yeah, that's, that's the one. That's mine. <laughs> so Rex sees Josh. So I guess he'll return the $20. Is that right, Rex? Yeah. Well, what we have is external rules that make better people, supposedly, but it doesn't really because what it makes is Pharisees. And a Pharisee is just someone, Pharisaism is pretension. They're just pretending to be something that they're not. They're pretending to pray on the street corners so that other people can see them and think they're devout. Oh, aren't they so devout? Oh, look at how holy he is. And that's your reward. Jesus didn't say it was wrong. He just said, well, that's your reward. You got your reward. If you want something more, <laughs> it's wrong. But if that's all you want, then you have your reward. You're serving nature because nature has its own order. Yet it's not given. You see, real eye is not given. You obey all the external rules. It's not given. There's more that you have to do. Only by shedding these outer shells of false personality, which we've taken as ourselves, will we ever reach essence. Will we ever reach real I? Will we ever reach the essential part of us? Essence, then, is like the child born on Christmas. It must develop. It must grow in wisdom and understanding in favor with man and with God, is how the story goes. Essence is something that has to develop. But it can't develop as long as we are so wrapped up in these overcoats and these helmets and these big boots. We've got to start to strip this away. We've got to start to see that this is not me. This is not I. I am not my personality. I'm not my overcoats. All of this development, this wisdom and understanding has to happen at the expense of the outer man that we call ourself. So when I say, today is a good day to die, what I mean is this outer man that you call yourself must be sacrificed, must be surrendered, must be given up so that this something, this essential part of you can grow, can unfold, can develop. And then you have a new life. Then you have transformation. Then you have a level of being change. Then you start to awaken to who you really are. Oh, we're awake now. We're awake now to personality. But the problem with being awake to personality is you're awake in a dream and you don't know that you're dreaming. You think it's real life, but it's not. This is the meaning of Christmas. The meaning of Christmas is there is something in you, this child, that can be developed, that can be grown, that can be found, that is in touch directly with the mystery of your own existence and the mystery of life and the mystery of this universe and that life can be totally, completely, absolutely altered by this realization, transformed by this realization. That's what I'm talking about.